Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all of the time. Puddles and I are here on campus at University of Oregon, here in the, the venerable Tuba Euphonium studio at the School of Music and Dance. And uh, we're so pleased to have a special guest, Mr. Ron Munson, with us. Ron, thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Ron, uh, uh, former Marine Band member, formerly of the San Antonio Symphony, um, played in the Seattle Symphony um, for a couple of years, a couple of seasons, on a substitute basis. On a substitute basis, yeah. Um, did the ring cycle up in Seattle a couple, right. three seasons? Three seasons. Yeah. yeah. And had some studies with uh, with Arnold Jacobs. Um, I'm wondering if you can just describe that, uh, what, what drew you to Jacobs, what that first that first experience with him was, was like. In the, it would have been 1959, you were telling me, correct? 59. It was at the summer at Gunnison in 1959. He was on the faculty there. Um, I had been to Interlochen the year before and had heard about him. And I, growing up in Nebraska at the time, um, I didn't know who the great tuba players were. And I heard about he and William Bell. And uh, heard he was going to be at Gunnison, and our family always uh, uh, went to Denver during the summer, so it was very convenient to get to go to um, uh, Gunnison. And my first experience with Jake was uh, um, I walked into the, the administration building to register, and I heard this most phenomenal tuba sound. I mean, there was no question about what it was. It was huge, it was beautiful. It filled the entire building, and I went. I was so excited. I went running down the hallway and burst through his door, and said, "Can I just listen to you play?" And he said, "Of course." I sat there and listened to him, and I I got that sound in my head. Well, during the four the two weeks that I was there, I had actually had four lessons with him, and uh, those were very valuable. But it was that hearing him play that really struck him. Uh, 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 an interest in it. Uh, I, it was like, that is what you can do with the tuba. And so I went home with uh, all the music that Jake had played that summer, um, and I went home with his sound in my head, and I went home and tried to sound like him. Yeah. And so it was a kind of a giant, it was a giant leap in, in, at that point in time. Do, do you remember, how would, how would you describe that sound? What would you well, the one thing about his sound that really struck me was that he played the instrument like a cello. He saw every note was very special. Uh, every note was going somewhere and doing something, and every note was meaningful. Um, and not, I had not heard that on a tuba before. Um, and I was always interested in the idea that tuba was a solo instrument, even though we didn't have the literature at the mm -hmm. time to play. And so uh, I uh, was just struck with that sound and just went home and tried to make it. One of the problems that, that happened was I didn't see him again until I was in college. Um, and of course, as time goes by and you don't hear the sound, uh, it kind of you kind of drift back into your own your own style again. Mm -hmm. I think young players today just have it absolutely made with all the recordings because you get a chance to hear what the great players sound like. You don't have to grow up in Chicago or New York or, or L.A. Or, or that, uh, to, to hear a great player. Yeah. You can get them on recording now. And, and uh, we didn't have that at the time. And, and so, you know, it faded away. But the more I studied with him during college, when I, got, I could get up to Chicago and everything, um, uh, the more the sound was reinforced. And, and he was, it was still my principal yeah. uh, influence as far as the way I play. Now, you um, mentioned the sound was what, you, what was really most impactful. Was there anything that you remember from those, those four lessons in addition to the sound? Or was it just the well, main sound that was so... It was mainly the sound at that point in time. Um, during the four lessons, I didn't really understand a lot of what he said, uh -huh. <laughs> you know. I can remember my eyes going glazed over a few times, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and because his, his knowledge of the human anatomy as far as applied to musical wind instruments was huge, it was vast. And it wasn't something you're going to pick up immediately. Right. It took, it took, it's like painting with watercolors, you know, you have to keep putting another coat on and, and each coat that you put on it gets a little darker and a little darker until finally you've got a real color. Yeah. And um, so um, that was in that initial meeting. That was the most, you know, the most I got out of it. Yeah. 
and then subsequently you would uh, study with him. You weren't you weren't ever in school with him per se. No. Um, but you would you would f meet up with him at various points around the country where he would be, right. and you would be. Right. Right. I got to Chicago as often as I could for lessons, and uh, um, one point that we had already discussed um, um, for the, the, the fixing point, you know, was that um, I was I was in my second I was starting my second year in the San Antonio Symphony, and I'd been our season had already ended, so I was not playing in a big hall anymore. And uh, I was practicing for the Boston Symphony audition at that time. 1965. And it was in 65. Yeah, and I, I was practicing very hard, and I set up some lessons with him to, to go check out, and make sure that everything was all right. And I got up there, and my first lesson with him, I played for a little bit, and Jake stopped me. And he says, "What have you been doing?" And I said, "What do you mean, what I've been doing? I've been practicing, you know, and every day." And, he says, but your sound is about this big. <laughs> and, you know, it was a real, uh, if, he, if I hadn't gone to him, and if I hadn't corrected, been able to correct it during the week I was with him, um, I wouldn't have ended up doing what I did at Boston. Mm -hmm. I, I, there were actually three of us that were the finalists at the Boston Symphony. There wasn't just two. And uh, I was one of those three. And uh, I never would have done that if it hadn't been for him. So he got you back on track just within a week's time to get mm -hmm. your sound back to... Right. So did, did he do... Uh, obviously, he pointed that out to you. Did he demonstrate for you more to get that, that sound rekindled in your thoughts, or were you able just to remind yourself on your own? Uh, no, I actually, we went through a series of the tests, you know, the, the, that uh, where he had the tube that connected to the hose and mm -hmm. you put your mouthpiece on it, and he had me hold the steel ball <laughs> at a certain level, mm -hmm. and... Uh, it became very obvious, you know, that that was necessary for, you know, to, to, uh, uh, had to get air moving. Yeah, to so just get, get a thicker right. caliber of air yeah. moving through it. So he, sounds like he hooked you up to some sort of um, metal, medical grade spirometer, not like the, the, the throwaways that we right. have these right. days, but something well, like actually, a spirometer this, of some sort. This thing was actually very simple. It was basically a glass tube that was graduated. Uh -huh. And he had a steel ball in it, and he had another uh, uh, neoprene or rubber hose that was hooked to that that you could either put your mouthpiece in or you could just blow into the tube. Yeah. And so um, uh, he had a little bleeder valve on the side of it. And uh, as you blew, he'd tell you to blow the ball up to a certain point. And then while you're b holding the ball at that point, he's, go ahead, he's opening up the bleeder valve. Okay. And so you had to move the air faster and faster to get the ball to move right. to stay at the same place. Right. Um, so that, and of course I, you know, did his respirometer as well. And, right. And uh, um, um, so uh, we did other things around the tuba, you know, at the time. It wasn't so much, I still had a sound in my head. Yeah. And so it wasn't really necessary for him to play uh, as much as it was just to get my ear moving and, and uh, produce that sound. Yeah. Sounds good. So after the Boston Symphony uh, audition, did you you went back to see him for subsequent lessons, and did, was there anything else that he helped you with? Um, at that, well, in regards to the focal dystonia problem, um, he when I went, of course, when it hit me, I was panicked. I was trying to figure out what the heck was wrong. And this would have been nineteen. This was in seventy-two. Okay. And um, I had been playing well up to that time, actually. The, um, I had gone back to school and, and was, had done three solo recitals during the time of this school and playing faculty quintet and, and this kind of thing. As an undergraduate? As an undergraduate, wow. yeah. And um, so uh, things were going fine until that uh, moment when suddenly one morning I woke up, I picked up my horn to warm up for a quintet concert, and all of a sudden my low notes were really squirrely cutting in and out. Huh. I kind of got through the concert that day by playing everything up an octave. Uh -huh. um, you know, so I, I made it happen, but the, the whole problem with the dystonia then continued to escalate and get worse and worse. Well, of course, the first thing I did was I went to Jake, because he was the guy that probably would know more than anybody about it. And there wasn't, at that time, we didn't know what even to call it. There were just players that all of a sudden ran into this problem with their playing. Huh. And um, he really didn't know the cause, but he made a statement to me that made very much sense and makes very much sense to me today. He just said, 
take it from where you can make a good sound and bring it down. And spread, bring it down. spread it around. Yeah, and eventually that worked out, and and uh, I was able to recover enough from the focal dystonia to, to do the Wagner ring with the Seattle Opera three years in a row, and to, to do all in my low register. I was having to, it wasn't a natural thing, I was actually beating it into happening, but I was practicing six hours a day, seven days a week, to just to get it to happen. And I would show up at the hall an hour early to warm up, mm -hmm. and I'd warm up based on those licks from the ring, mm -hmm. uh, just to get everything going. And I was able to do it, but the Estonia wasn't gone. It was, you know, I was masking it, but I was able to do it well enough that people couldn't tell there was a problem. Yeah. Did you have any subsequent lessons after that uh, with regard to the this issue? No, I, I, I made the mistake of that being the last one. Oh. I should have gone back to it. Yeah. And uh, I remember you wrote an article in the, uh, the ITEA journal maybe seven years ago or eight years ago. It's quite a while ago, yeah. Um, so two, 2006 or 2007-ish, mm -hmm. yeah. where you talked about uh, dystonia. And at, at that point, you you had a different point of view than you do today based upon what we were discussing earlier. Yeah, I think it's correctable. Uh, I, my feeling is now that I think Jake was right in, in that uh, had I been able to follow through and stay cool uh, to not allow the panic to keep coming back, I think I could have worked through it. Uh, there are a couple of people who have at this point in time worked through it. David Vining, you know, the trombone player at Arizona State is, is uh, a good example. He's, he can play. Um, I am practicing today, oddly enough, at my age, uh, 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 two and a half hours a day, uh, with the idea purely of closing the gap, you know, of, of closing out on the on the dystonia. And uh, um, I had I got a copy of the dystonia ca um, a dialogue recently that uh, said that they really are linking the dystonia to stress and uh, anxiety. And uh, uh, the, and I know that it was kind of funny because I've I've talked to a lot of people uh, uh, about their dystonia, for instance, and we don't have there's things that are not in common, mm. Um, mm. and 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 in personalities, uh, uh, it's uh, one person I know who is very outgoing personally um, has it. And I'm really kind of surprised because he seems to be one of the most laid-back people I know. Hmm. Um, another another one of my colleagues has uh, his situation. He's a bass drummer player. His situation is very similar to mine. Um, had this very same thing. Unfortunately for him, it came it came apart for him during uh, the orchestra season. It was a very painful situation. Mm -hmm. Um, in my case, um, well, it was a painful situation <laughs> where I was, but but uh, I walked away from it and and uh, I, and kind of regrouped and and then was inspired to start practicing again. And little by little, the notes started to come back. Hmm. But uh, it took quite a while, and and it's a matter of being able to relax. I think the tuba requires a person to be totally relaxed to play it. I, you know, I don't, it, especially when we're dealing with low, low register. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, uh, I certainly wasn't that person. Um, I had a lot of stress at the time that the dystonia happened, the uh, bad divorce, um, uh, uh, and looking for a job at the same time finishing a master's degree. Mm -hmm. And I had just too many, too many irons in the fire, mm -hmm. and it just all came unglued. Uh, but I'm I'm very I'm encouraged today. You know, the nice thing about today is there's no career. I'm not under pressure to do anything. Mm -hmm. I can take days off, like coming up here, you know, to visit. Um, and it's all right. And I'm, and I'll pick up the pieces when I get home, mm -hmm. and I'll just start where I left off. I'm taking a, a, a different attitude too. Uh, there's a Buddhist concept of, of beginner's mind. Mm -hmm. It is basically um, that to uh, every day is a new day, every day is a new experience. It's like you're starting to play for the first time ever mm -hmm. and starting to discover, and it seems to be working. You know, between that and my my having no pressure, um, little by little, my low register is coming back again. Uh, the I, I can't tell now because 
you know, at my age, my lung capacity is not as big as it was before, so I'm not sure where the lung capacity problem leads off mm -hmm. and uh, where the dystonia is still there. But little by little, I'm able to sustain those loan notes better and better. And, uh, That's great. Um, and we'll see. And I, I figure that if, if I'm successful, then I probably will celebrate by doing a recital or something like that at the end. You know, that'd be great. And so, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's an if. And if it ha doesn't happen, I'm okay. Okay, that sounds good. Ron, uh, so during that 13-year period from 1959 to 1972, did you have, I'm sure you must have encountered Mr. Jacobs in some special ways. Any, any good stories or memories? Well, actually, yes. Uh, um, I was on tour with the Marine Band, um, and we were playing in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I was in a particularly foul mood that day, and I went straight to my room and just spread out on the bed, you know, and I was steaming, and I can't tell you what I was steaming about. But one of the trumpet players in the band called called my room and says, "Hey, Jacobs is down here in the audit, in the lobby. And wants to see you." <laughs> and so I'm thinking, "Oh, this is a big prank." And so I get in the in the, uh, in the elevator and I'm thinking about how I'm going to punch this guy out when I get down there. <laughs> and sure enough, the Chicago Symphony had played the night before uh, we played, and they were staying in the same hotel, and Jake was there. Wow. And within minutes of being with him, all of that anger and all that frustration was gone. I absolutely felt very comfortable, you know, being around him. I was so happy to see him. And so, and, and he was so genuinely warm. And, and uh, uh, we only had about 15 or 20 minutes before they had to catch the plane. But it was very, very special. That's nice. And yeah. uh, another time when I was in New York City working, um, the Chicago Symphony was in town, and uh, um, Jake and I got together, and I told him about uh, a, an F2 that was hanging in the window of one of the music stores. And I, you know, we went down to go look at this horn. Well, Jake asked to, to see it. And the salesman <laughs> wasn't willing to get the horn down. He says, you give me 350 bucks, and you can have the horn. You know. Well, of course, Jake wasn't ready to do this. And I, I, I as a young person at that point in time, I'm standing there just stewed. I couldn't, I couldn't believe the salesperson. I said, "You don't have any idea who you're talking to," you know. And Jake very calmly said, "Okay, if you don't, if you're not interested in showing me the horn, he says that's fine." And we walked out of the store. And I learned a real lesson that time, just seeing him stay cool under a situation that really put me off. And uh, couldn't believe that the salesperson was that dumb, you know. So, you know, I, at the time I left the New York, left New York, that F2 was still hanging in the, <laughs> still hanging in the window. Nobody had gotten to get it, and gone to get it. But it was an Alexander, and uh, silver, it was silver, mm -hmm. and, uh, but it's gone. I, I, I don't know what happened to the store now. Yeah. Well, Jacobs uh, certainly had a very calming effect. I know in my, in my, in my own case, it was always very, calming to walk into a studio or to call him on Sunday night to set up the lesson time, mm -hmm. just hearing his voice. It was always very pleasant. It was so resonant. Yeah. His voice was so resonant. You know, I, um, one of the very special times I had gone out for a lesson and he invited me to have lunch with he and his wife, you know, at, at his home right after the lesson. And that just meant so much to me mm -hmm. to, to be invited to his house to, you know, to have, yeah. have lunch. That's pretty nice. Yeah, it's a pretty special thing. So he always treated me extremely well. And I, the only regrets I have is that I was in and out of playing for a number of years and kind of out of and away from it at the time he passed away. And my biggest regret is not having had the chance to tell him how I felt about him. Mm -hmm. And about all the things he had done for me during, you know, during the time I yeah. had worked with him, he was very, very special, and uh, uh, and and his sound is still in my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And uh, uh, so, oh, I, know, oh, I know the you know one other thing too. Um, one of my, I think it was a year that I went up to Montero's conducting school in Maine. Uh, we stopped by Chicago and had a lesson with him, you know, and, but we went out to Ravinia to hear the orchestra, 
And it was the first time I actually heard him in the orchestra. And they were doing the excerpts from Greta Dameron that are on that recording called Reiner Conduct Wagner. Mm -hmm. And he sounded the same way out there that he sounded in that recording. I mean, it was just, well, the whole brass section was so wonderful at that time. It was such a, a great section. And, and uh, but he sounded just like that recording. I felt, you know, I couldn't get out of the car fast enough, you know, to get over there and, mm -hmm. and hear the rehearsal. Uh, but it was just, it was very, very special to hear him play. Um, I remember also, because of his knowledge in medicine, um, you know, in respiration especially, um, I remember hearing that they were, the Mayo Clinic was sending patients down to him to work on their uh, respiratory problems. And when I was in D.C. in the band, he was out in D.C. to speak at a medical convention on respiration at that point in time. Wow, so this would have been in the 60s? It was in the 60s, yeah. Wow, okay. So, um, yeah, he was a recognized authority on respiration and, and uh, uh, as applied to, to musical instruments. I know he had oboe students, he had, mm -hmm. he had students of all different instruments. You know, yeah. And it wasn't just us guys, you know, the two of Right, right. And um, uh, he was a very, very, uh, very special person. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's so great that you could uh, um, take some time out of your trip. I know you're traveling from Durango, Colorado, up to Seattle. And just to make a little side trip to Eugene it means a lot, and I appreciate it very much. Well, that's we've been trying to get together for about a year or so to uh, meet right. up for this audition. Uh, this audition. <laughs> There's a slip. <laughs> this interview. Yeah. And um, do I have um, to play now? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> yeah. Start with the ride of the Valkyries. Yeah. Right. Followed by Prokofiev uh, Five. Yeah, yeah, and then then we'll finish it off with Beatles. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, certainly my time here at University of Oregon, I've, I've had the opportunity to have some of your students in the, in the studio. And I think the most recent was Austin Summerfield, and um, always, they always um, well, did a great job. Almost got carry. <laughs> almost got, that's right, almost. Yeah. But uh, in any event, we'd uh, like to present you with a, our token of Thanksgiving uh, that you're here with this genuine Tuba People TV well, thank you. water bottle. Or you can actually put anything in it you want. It doesn't have to be water. Well, water is about my big thing these days. Okay, so. sounds good. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ron. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And now back to you.